Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Stephanie Bridges, and I'm a product marketing manager here at Tripwire. I am very excited to partner with the folks here at Brinka today to deliver this webinar uh, discussing uh, delivering security analytics to reduce risk exposure. Um, before we get started today, um, I'd like to make a couple of introductions. Uh, we have two fantastic speakers here from Brinka joining me. First, we have Kevin Gallagher, the Vice President of Global Sales at Brinka. Kevin has over 20 years experience in sales, sales management, and business development. His ability to connect business needs with technology has led to a successful career with startups, as well as a couple of the bigger guys, established companies such as Sun Microsystems and Computer Associates. Then second, we have Saeed Adur, who is a senior product manager at Brinka. He's there he's responsible um, for the overall strategy of the Brinka product line, which includes roadmap, competitive analysis, requirements gathering, and user story creation. His experience includes technical software development as well as delivering large enterprise security applications. Welcome to you both. Thanks for joining us. So first, though, before we get into the meat of our presentation, I'd like to walk you through an agenda of what we'll be discussing today. So today we're going to be talking about delivering security analytics to reduce risk exposure and the combined solution between Brinka and Tripwire. Here I've got a quick agenda around what we're going to cover. We will start out going over a bit about Brinka and Tripwire. We're also going to talk about security analytics space uh, you know, as a whole and then some of the challenges there that we found. Then also we'll discuss uh, the integrated security analytics solution brought to you by Brinka and Tripwire and we'll go into a couple of use cases. And then finally, we're going to turn it over to Syed, who will take you through a live demo of the integrated solution. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kevin so we can get started. Great. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, we're very excited today to talk to you about the integrated solution between uh, Brinka and Tripwire. First, I'll give you a quick overview of Brinka. Uh, Brinka is a software company founded in 2008. We have our corporate headquarters in Austin, Texas. And then we also have offices on the East Coast, the West, and as well as the Midwest, and we're also growing our global presence internationally as well. The whole purpose of Brinka was to be able to answer those most pressing questions that you're getting on a regular basis. What is your risk exposure to the next heartbeat? You know, how do you reduce that risk and the overall risk exposure of your organization? How do you prioritize and respond you know, in a timely manner? So what we're doing is really addressing that biggest challenge in risk, anal and in risk analysis by being able to not only assess the information that you have, but be able to respond in a way that makes it make sense for the organization by prioritizing those risks and being able to communicate them at the level that your business expects. Last but not least, we are definitely a proven technology um, we're trusted by Fortune 100 companies, and then in, in our case, we are providing you a very unified analytics platform, non-modular based, and the ability to really scale in, uh, from a, a, an enterprise perspective. We've also received two awards this, uh, over the last couple of years. One is an industry uh, innovator by SC Magazine, and then just this year, we were named uh, the cool vendor in security analytics by Gartner. Stephanie? Thank you, Kevin. Uh, now a little bit about Tripwire. Um, we deliver advanced threat security and compliance solutions that are used by over 9,000 organizations, including, I believe, it's approximately 50% of the Fortune 500. Uh, we were founded in 1997, and in uh, 2000, we contributed source code to the open source community to enable open source Tripwire, uh, which actually is the tool that remains in use today. And uh, we continue to invest heavily in innovation, and we hold over 20 security innovation patent, patents. Uh, Kevin, if you can move to the next slide, that would be great. So we've come a long way from those open source days, and um, today our integrated portfolio of security solutions includes vulnerability management, configuration and policy management, file integrity monitoring, and log intelligence. Uh, these solutions really deliver critical security intelligence, detecting indicators of breach, compromise, and vulnerability. 
And when I take a look at our solutions, I really like to roll it up into kind of four different key competencies. So we offer reliable data with the broadest and deepest library of security and compliance policies. That business context, which is really important to identify changes and vulnerabilities that create the most risk and help prioritize security actions. Uh, security automation to continuously monitor all change and ensure system integrity. And then finally, that enterprise integration with great partners such as Brinka to improve analytics, forensics, uh, incident detection and response. So with that, I'll pass it back to Kevin. Thank you, Stephanie. Now we're going to take a look about why risk analytics. What's the need for risk analytics uh, in your company today? As you can see from the quotes above, uh, both Gartner and Forrester are recognizing this space as something that is a high priority for organizations. In a recent Gartner survey of CIOs, analytics and business intelligence was ranked as the top priority. Forrester views analytics as a top security trend for 2014, basically saying that analytics will help better predict threats and protect data. Breaches have opened the eyes of security professionals leading to the need for better understanding of how exposed their organization is. And as, I, as you can see from the stats above, this is reflective uh, from security risk analytics. 93 reported a decrease in security incidents. 83% reported swift for troubleshooting, and 77% experienced reduction in fraud. Uh, those are huge changes within an organization just by uh, applying some security analytics to what they're doing today. So why isn't everybody doing this? Uh, there are some key challenges, obviously, in, in, in analyzing risk, and I'm sure uh, a lot of you that are uh, on the phone today can understand. First of all, it's really difficult to uh, understand where this data sits. Um, it's very uncorrelated. It's redundant data. Um, it, it's really uh, in multiple different uh, databases uh, sitting across the organization, it's, and it's looked at you know a little bit differently across uh, each each area, uh, which leads to really you know, kind of a you know, disparate uh, security risk in inventories. There's no historical data for trending uh, and or forecasting as well. Another major issue is how do we bring all this information together at once? Um, right now, it's spreadsheets, it's uh, access databases, it's you know, sitting in five different databases. Um, it's you know, how do we bring all this information together. You know, right now it's just manual and it's inconsistent and there's there's really difficulty, a lot of difficulty being able to correlate this information even if you do have it uh, in one one uh, central area. Another issue is that because it is across multiple different business units and because it is sitting in multiple different areas and because you know, risk is looked at by different systems um, you know, uh, across the enterprise differently, it leads to really subjective and a non-standard way of doing security risk me uh, measurements. You might have red, yellow, and green uh, measuring one aspect of it. You might have a scoring system measuring the other. It's not normalized and it's not looked at and reviewed across the organization the same. And then last but certainly not least is how are you able to take this security data and then be able to apply it to, to the business? be able to take this information and, and, and show the business, you know, how is this affecting them overall. So it really today, um, you know, there's, there's the, the business unit's ability to understand and accept the risk is very difficult. The, there's a, you know, really no ability to measure improvements and or predict threats or what the effect of those threats are going to be across the business. And what that leads to, it allows you to be you know, in more of a, a reactive mode uh, versus proactive in making decisions based off of the security information that you have in your organization. So today we're going to talk to you about the solution that we've come up with between Brinka and Tripwire, and it is a security risk analytics solution to help you better protect, pre prevent and predict threats in your organization. So as you can see here from the chart, this is an integrated solution between Tripwire and Brinka. Uh, along the bottom, you have uh, Brink, uh, Tripwire solutions for being able to do asset discovery 
uh, ability to look at you know security configurations, uh, the ability to look at man uh, vulnerabilities, uh, the ability to map and, and correlate the information from an asset perspective. And with them having all this information, we can pull that directly into Brinka with our connectors that we built uh, together to be able to pull this information in from Tripwire uh, IP360 as well as Tripwire Enterprise, which allows us now to be able to model an organization's risk framework. And we're going to be able to do this by defining and representing hierarchies, you know, tolerance levels, ownership, um, def different uh, performance indicators. And a lot of this we're going to be able to show uh, in the demo uh, as we go along. Actually, the other thing that we're able to do this, now – oh, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, Absolutely. if I could right add on to this. Um, you know, I'm really excited about this partnership because we've had a lot of Tripwire customers actually come to us requesting, you know, more flexibility with reporting and analytics so they could really extend and customize, uh, you know, the security data they get from Tripwire IP360 and Tripwire I, um, Enterprise for just really a broader view of their current security partner, uh, current security posture. So really partnering with you guys has allowed us to – really take the core competencies that we have in, you know, different areas within the IT security space and kind of combine them to solve these real customer problems. And, you know, a, it's extremely valuable for IT security professionals simply because not only are they able to manage down and prioritize, you know, remediation of vulnerabilities and configuration challenges, but they can also manage up into the organization by being able to present these reports you know, on the progress of security, compliance, and operation teams, you know, up to the CISOs and the board level. So it's really exciting, you know, for Tripwire to be able to work with you guys on this as well. So that was just my two cents. I had to add that. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate that. And you're, you're absolutely correct. You know, by – with the combined solution, giving us an integrated asset uh, data and, and being able to model that data uh, through the integration, being able to assign you know, that business impact and, and also be able to have more of a qualitative value to the risk information uh, that we're bringing in, being able to, to really look at this information from an overall risk perspective. So any incidents that occur, you're not just looking at those list of issues and, and trying to solve them you know, one by one. You're actually taking a look at these issues from a risk perspective. So now you know how to prioritize. So as you're stating, you're bringing this information, the security data uh, in from uh, the Tripwire solutions into Brinka gives us the ability to correlate all that information together. And then when the CISO does come and ask you, you know, how are we doing or, or, or what is our effect uh, going to be if we do get hit by Heartbleed, you'll be able to have those answers that are, that are relevant to the business by being able to show the impact to the organization through the analysis that we've done with the two tools. So as you can see from you know, the left-hand box here, you know, there's, there's a couple of really strong um, benefits of, of the integrated solution. And you know, one is what we just talked about. You know, you're, you're aligning and, and really having you know, more of a risk-based uh, security model. You're actually able to deliver critical security controls in real time to, to the customers. And then you're also being able to provide a flexible and scalable uh, – you know, we are providing you with a flexible and scalable uh, deployment option, which means that because we've been working so hard together on this integration, we can, in days, be able to come in, plug into uh, the Tripwire solution, and show you uh, within hours uh, information that we're able to pull together and analyze and report on. And again, we'll show you a lot more of that uh, during the demo. So a few more of the, the customer benefits uh, of this combined solution. The ability to determine the business impact of vulnerabilities is huge. Not only going to be able to determine the impact of the vulnerabilities, but also being able to risk prioritize the incidents that, that are exposed. Quantitative analysis to determine business cost of the vulnerability. So now we're going to be able to turn this around and, and give you more of a business impact of the overall vulnerabilities and incidents to the organization. One of the key benefits that we talked about earlier was you know, with all these disparate systems or uh, with all this information sitting in multiple different databases, being able to pull this all into one um, solution allows you to normalize the scoring. So you're now able to understand you know, that red, yellow, and green means the same thing across uh, the organization. And then the last but not least is really that, that incident prioritization, uh, which is very important. And we want to be able to 
uh, manage that from an overall organizational goals and mandates so that we are addressing those most important issues. What we have seen, and this kind of aligns to what we saw from uh, what Forrester and Gartner were saying, is that we've seen a 65% reduction in issue and incident remediation efforts. We've seen a 55% reduction in any type of uh, assessment efforts, and that could be, you know, uh, questionnaires that you're you're doing, surveys that you're doing, um, you know, throughout the organization. And then the big one is the 70% reduction in the information gathering efforts. All this leading to you being able to do what your job is versus having to be the one that's trying to gather information and analyze or correlate this information together and then trying to come up with you know, what are the metrics that, that the organization is looking for. We automate that whole process for you so that you have the ability to actually go out and start to do things more effectively for your organization. Now we'll talk about a couple of case studies. And we'll just go through these briefly and then we will, uh, I'll turn this over to Syed so he can take you through the demo. First one is a Fortune uh, global technology firm. And this is, was an organization that was really struggling with the, the millions of vulnerabilities that they were uh, trying to track daily. They did not have um, you know, a true asset hierarchy. They did not have the ability to understand you know, what vulnerabilities uh, overall impacts were uh, to the organization. And then they were really struggling with, okay, now that we understand these vulnerabilities, how do we, how do we go about doing the closed loop remediation efforts? So really identifying the key vulnerabilities that pose you know, the highest risk to the business, um, being able to provide visibility to management, uh, which is key. Uh, were some of the mandates that they were they were tasked with. So with this combined solution, what we've been able to do is really centralize, you know, create a, a more centralized risk repository, and be able to create a, a more holistic uh, um, approach to this from from an asset hierarchy perspective. So we're able to view things from you know here's the here's the process all the way down through to to virtual IP. We were provided we were also able to provide um, a very flexible risk analysis model with closed loop remediation for the host vulnerabilities. All of this tied together into their ticketing system so that we are able to, to not only uh, monitor the vulnerabilities, prioritize those, map them back uh, based off of the asset hierarchy, but also then being able to do the closed loop remediation by having this tied into their, to their overall ticketing system. And then one more, uh, this is more from a, an overall uh, risk perspective, not just vulnerabilities, but you know, configuration management, vulnerabilities, and being able to look at that more holistically and be able to come up with a, 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 you know, a risk uh, hierarchy. Uh, this particular customer wanted to be able to understand the risk at an application level. So what are all the things that are affecting that application and how do I determine whether or not that application is a high risk to the organization or low? Uh, things such as, you know, does it contain PII? You know, what are the you know, security configurations that we have uh, on the system today? You know, what vulnerabilities are impacting uh, the application? And then you, you can be able to prioritize those uh, as critical applications and score them um, differently from a risk perspective so that they become a higher priority uh, for the organization. So what we have here is, again, you know, more of a centralized inventory to capture this information, flexible analysis on the information that we capture, as well as being able to do what-if analysis. So you can become a lot more, uh, as we talked about in, in an earlier slide, a lot more um, you know, proactive versus being reactive in managing the overall risk. So with that said, now that I've talked you know, through some slides. I think it'd be great now that we can go ahead and and show you uh, what the what the actual product looks like. So I will turn this over to Sayed, and uh, Sayed, take it away. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you to you and Stephanie for doing such an excellent job of providing the context and really defining the drivers for um, the integrated solution that we're going to be looking at. Um, so the integrated solution it delivers a uniform platform in which to analyze risk records coming in from a variety of tripwire products. Um, in the demo uh, following, we're going to be looking at a solution which has integrated information from Tripwire Enterprise as well as Tripwire IP360. Um, but we have additional integrations in the pipeline for CCM and for Log Center that will essentially be integrated into the solution as well. 
Um, so the three key streams of information that we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at vulnerability information coming in from IP360, um, and we're going to be looking at change in compliance information coming in from Tripwire Enterprise. Uh, before we get into the demo, um, just some of the key characteristics that we have tried to achieve with this integrated solution is that we've tried to keep it very simple and easy for people to use. Um, so it's really easy for um, a customer to get started with this instance. Um, all you have to do is provide endpoint configuration, essentially where your Tripwire instances live um, and what are the credentials for the accounts that you would like to use to pull this information. Um, and that is essentially all the information that you need to provide to the system. Uh, that's all the configuration that has to be done to essentially get everything that we're going to be covering in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Um, the solution also aims to be highly scalable. Um, it scales for depth and breadth really well, um, which means that it, it scales for magnitude of data really well if you have to acquire IP360 instances that are reporting millions of vulnerabilities. Um, it, it can handle that amount of data very easily. Um, it can also scale really well in the sense that if you have additional instances, either of Tripwire IP360 or Tripwire Enterprise or the additional Tripwire products that are going to be integrated into this, it's very easy to bring them on board. Um, it provides a, a uniform platform essentially to analyze and report on all of this risk information that is coming in. And we're going to be looking at some of the key analytical processes that we apply to sort of come up with um, the reports and analytics that really deliver value um, to business. Um, so let's, let's start by looking at sort of the highest level of abstraction in this data model, which, include this, which includes business entities like lines of businesses, um, which in turn have applications running under them, uh, which in turn utilize host information that is coming in from IP360 and is being correlated to the system information coming in from Tripwire Enterprise. Um, so essentially, we're, we're delivering a single point of risk analysis for both of these tools, as well as aggregating and contextualizing it for the business entities. So let's quickly look at the business overview um, dashboard. So as a user that has access to multiple lines of businesses that is sort of responsible for managing and monitoring the risk on multiple lines of businesses, there are a few key criteria that I want to be able to reflect immediately. Um, so I want to be able to say, for instance, how the different data centers or locations underlying my businesses are doing um, and how is my performance across these different data centers. I want to be able to say at a glance how are the different lines of businesses doing for these individual streams of risk that I'm monitoring. So for, in, for instance, in this case, the, the, the three distinct streams of risk that we're going to be looking at is vulnerability change in compliance, um, but we're also calculating a dependency risk rating, which is going to be based on the underlying applications in the case of businesses and the underlying hosts in the case of applications. Um, and we're going to be contextualizing and normalizing this information at every step and also coming up with a final quantitative and qualitative risk rating and score. One additional level of detail that I would want to be able to see is while I'm looking at, say, a business, I want to be able to see the underlying performance of components as well. So, for instance, I want to be able to, in a, in a scenario where threshold defines the risk tolerance of applications um, for a business, I want to be able to say how many of my applications are doing okay and how many of them are falling above my threshold for tolerance. Um, and threshold is, is a really interesting um, metric because it allows you to really be flexible in your organization with respect to how you monitor and, re and report on risk. So you can set individual thresholds for different lines of businesses based on their criticality and so on. So by looking at all these three sort of consolidated views, I can kind of tell that I have this corporate operations business that, is, that seems to be the most problematic. So let's drill down into this and try to figure out where the actual sources of risk are and what, what are the things that I need to prioritize and look at immediately. So the analytical process of framework that we applied when looking at multiple lines of businesses, we're going to sort of carry that over to individual businesses as well. Um, and 
we're going to put a lot of emphasis on these individual streams of businesses or the uh, streams of risk or these individual dimensions of risk and at the same time try to get information from levels one or two or three, three levels down. So to split the individual risk ratings or the final risk ratings of this business into the main dimensions of risk, um, we call this attack surface analysis. It's a term that is used by Encircle or IP360 as well, and we're going to see how we use this pattern in different uh, hierarchy levels of the business hierarchy as well when we look at individual vulnerabilities and we split it into multiple attack surfaces. Um, but at this level, if we look at the three main streams, which is compliance, change, and vulnerability, um, this immediately gives me an idea of how I'm doing um, or how this business is doing um, with respect to averages across the system as well as the maximum possible ratings. Um, so I can tell that, you know, my, my change in vulnerability ratings are pretty bad, doing a little better on compliance and dependency. Um, and I am normalizing information from these, all of these streams of information um, individually. And what I mean by that is that when we treat these individual streams um, as distinct streams of information, we can set thresholds for each of them individually. And that is sort of what we're doing here. So all these three streams, um, when they're reported from the different required products, um, they have their own risk scoring methodology that is on different scales. So we're sort of adjusting the scales dynamically as well as allowing um, organizations to define their individual thresholds to essentially, to, to essentially say that if, if I pass a certain score for, say, vulnerability management, that is what, when I want to rate my entity as a critical or as a high. Um, so not only are we normalizing information, we're normalizing information intelligently. Um, and then we're consolidating that information to come up with a final uh, risk rating for this business. So let's, let's try to figure out where the main sources of risk are. Um, so looking at this uh, breakdown of the underlying applications for this business, I can see that there are six applications under this business. Each of them has this total number of hosts uh, for it, un under it. So we're looking at probably around 300, 350 hosts. And for the most part, I, I, I can see that they're doing okay. So let's, let's try to get rid of some of the noise and try to identify exactly where the problems are. So when I get rid of the low, low, low rated hosts, uh, I can see that it seems like there are four main problem hosts under this application or under this line of business. And there is a host under PDX, under the PDX application, which seems to be causing all the problems. So we'll drill down into that um, a bit more and try to figure out why it is providing, mm, why it is contributing that much to the overall risk ratings. Um, before that, however, we're also doing a final analysis of the individual applications. So I can see, for instance, how all the six applications under this business are doing, uh, what their final risk ratings are, and so on. Uh, but we'll skip applications and we'll go one level deeper, which is at the host level. So on that list, you could see that of the top 10 problematic hosts, there's one which is rated critical, a couple which are rated high, and the rest would seem okay. So let's look at this particular host and try to figure out why it's, it's contributing so much to uh, the overall risk. So again, by doing this attack surface analysis where we're splitting the individual risk scores into these distinct dimensions, I can see that it is fairly highly rated for vulnerability and compliance changes a little bit better, um, but it is still contributing to a high rating. Um, and when we try to figure out why, um, Let's look at these individual compliance records. So we can see that each of these compliance records, they have an initial risk rating of either a high or medium and so on, but eventually it is getting evaluated to a critical. And the reason for that is what we call contextualization. Um, and that is when we look at the staging environment for this host, we see that this is a production host, um, which means that every risk record on this host is going to be evaluated um, to a much higher final value. Um, and when we look at that and when we look at how many compliance failures exist on this system, how many uh, problematic changes exist on this system, uh, we can sort of figure out that that is the reason why we're seeing such a high risk rating which gets cascaded all the way up to the application. So a couple of key things here. Um, we, like I said, we are contextualizing this raw risk data coming out of tripwire products 
based on um, the risk criteria that is relevant to an organization. Um, so I showed you an example where we're looking at the host staging environment to do that determination, but we're also looking at a lot of additional factors. For instance, for applications, we're looking at whether an application is client-facing or whether an application is exposed to the Internet or whether an ex application is required to be PCI compliant and so on. And uh, all of those factors get, get factored in to the final risk ratings for these risk records. Um, so we're contextualizing every single record coming out of the tripwire products, and we are also aggregating that information at every level of the business hierarchy. So if I look at a, at, at a business uh, which is at the highest level of the hierarchy, I can still immediately identify the main problems, which are essentially three or four levels down. Um, and that, that is sort of a, it's, 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 it's not a very obvious thing to grasp, but it gives businesses and business owners a lot of benefit and a lot of insight where they can, they can essentially go to vulnerability management teams and tell them exactly what the mandate is for fixing a problem. Um, and typically technology security teams, um, they, they're looking at a very specific kind of information. So a vulnerability management team is most likely only going to be looking at the severity of vulnerabilities coming from vulnerability management tools. And unless you sort of apply this business context at every level of your business hierarchy, it's very easy to miss a lot of, um, a lot of relevance for why a certain action needs to be taken and why you should invest time and effort into uh, fixing a particular problem. Um, so let's look at one of these compliance records as well. And I, I want to highlight the, the, the benefits of having this highly connected data model. Um, so what we can do when we look at these individual problems is I can also immediately say all the places in the organization where this compliance test is failing. I can identify which hosts have the highest risk rating for this compliance failure, which means that after I apply all my contextual information to the risk records, where is this compliance is causing the most problems? And I can also quickly see all the other places in the organization where this compliance test is failing. So in addition to contextualizing and adding um, relevant risk criteria at every step of the business hierarchy, we, we also have access to this highly, highly diverse, breadth-first um, view of information where you can look at a problem, where you can, where you can realize that if, you're, if I have a hard lead vulnerability in my system, where else in my organization do I have the problem? And it gives you a really quick and really easy way to, to query that type of information. Um, so uh, hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea about the risk framework, about how we're evaluating uh, risk at every step of the process. Um, so let's quickly go to reports, since analytics and reporting is sort of the focus of this demo. Um, and we look at some of these reports in a little bit more detail, uh, we gloss over a few. Um, but essentially, we have, a lot of, we have a lot of flexibility when building these reports. Um, and all of these reports, they're completely configurable, which means that if at any point you, a customer wants to define more of these reports, it's very easy for them to sort of define them, categorize them, and present them in this um, easy-to-use and easy-to-access interface. Um, so the Change Top 10 report is sort of looking at risk in the organization, uh, specifically from the change point of view, trying to identify the main, uh, prob main areas of problem uh, when we talk about risk from a change perspective. So I want to be able to say, for instance, what are the most common changes in, in the organization that I'm responsible for? Um, which are the changes that are resulting in the highest risks? Um, which are the hosts in the system that have the highest uh, risk associated with them because of change records. Similarly, I can do sort of when their first approach is where I can, where I can query um, the underlying operating systems or the underlying vendors, for instances, and figure out which vendors or which operating systems are contributing to the most change-related risk in the system. Similarly, I can do this more from a network and systems point of view where I can identify which networks in my organization are resulting in the highest change records and change risks. 
And of course, we can also do this from sort of the business context point of view, where I want to be able to identify which of the applications that I'm responsible for has the highest change risk associated with them. So really, the, the focus for the top 10 kind of reports is um, immediate value, uh, highlight the main problems, highlight sort of the main problem areas, and give you a very quick and concise view of, of risk as, as, as it pertains to, say, change or compliance and so on. Um, the non-compliant changes is, is a very interesting uh, report, and the reason for that is that it's, it's one of the places in, in, in this report catalog where we're looking at each of these, where we're looking at these three streams of information together. So for instance, in the compliance vulnerability spectrum, what we're trying to establish is how are my changes in the spectrum of compliance and vulnerability risks? So for instance, if I have these three, let's say, uh, types of changes in the system, which is removed, added, and modified, I want to be able to say um, where all the removed systems in my um, organizational hierarchy are, not so much from a physical point of view, but from a risk point of view. Um, and looking at this uh, interactive chart where you can, you know, remove certain criteria, drill down into specific things, I can tell immediately that most of my changes or most of my removal changes are done on systems that have low vulnerability and compliance risks, but I do have some, some changes being on systems that have, that are sort of in the problem area, problem part of the spectrum. Um, and, and this is, this gives you an immediate action item. Essentially, as, as somebody who's responsible for, say, managing a bunch of systems with respect to change, I don't want changes to be made on systems that are non-compliant. I don't want changes to be made on systems that have a high vulnerability risk because it adds to the overall risk against these changes. Um, and by building this, this sort of multi-dimensional um, analytical charts, um, you, can, you can very accurately and very quickly pinpoint all the main problem areas. Um, similarly, for instance, if I want to do a quantitative analysis of changes versus compliance, uh, I can immediately find out which changes have the most frequency on systems that also have the highest compliance failures on them. Um, to put sort of a qualitative spin on it, I can immediately say which are the changes that are contributing the highest change risk um, that also happen to be on systems that are contributing high compliance risks. So again, sort of building a multi-dimensional perspective on, um, on, on this risk data. So compliance top 10 is very similar to the change top 10. Again, very concise, very accurate, very to the point. Tell me all the common compliance failures. Tell me all the common compliance risks. Tell me where these risks lie. Tell me all the hosts, the operating systems, the networks and applications, and so on. Um, so when we talk about compliance, um, different types of reports that we can do is we can do standard-based reports. So for instance, um, if I have people in my organization that are specifically responsible for, say, PCI compliance, I can present them with this type of a report which looks at PCI tests specifically, um, and I can, again, give them a historical perspective where I can tell them that this is how, uh, this is the trend of PCI test failure and success over this past year. Um, and I can tell them accurate, concise information as well, which is, you know, these are the compliance tests that are failing the most. These are the compliance tests that have the highest risks associated with them. So you're giving them, um, you're giving them a good idea about the program overall by presenting trend and historical information, and, and you're also giving them uh, accurate, actionable uh, metrics. So... Let's look at a couple of these period risks, um, period uh, reports. Now, period reports are, are really interesting because they give you, um, they give you um, the opportunity to do a couple of very interesting things. Uh, for instance, I, I, I definitely want to be able to tell um, that given, given this week or this month or this year, uh, which were my top offenders. So, for instance, I want to be able to say which, which vulnerability was exploited the most or is, ex is the most exploitable for this period, um, which was the most common compliance failure, which was the most common change, and also which was the most common host that had the most changes or most risk records associated with it. Uh, but it also gives you the ability to sort of do these comparative uh, analysis. So for instance, um, the trend reports that we have in this, in this report 
um, they're, they're evaluating the quantity of risk records for each of these streams, as well as the effect of those risk records. Uh, for instance, I can say that the week of um, August 7th uh, was a little bit better in terms of the count of vulnerabilities. However, the average risk associated with these vulnerabilities went up. Um, so this would be sort of an anomaly that I would want to look at deeper. So I would want to go and look at the vulnerability records in this period in a little bit more detail to figure out if, if you know, we were, we were fixing problems that maybe do not give, give us that much benefit, um, where we should be trying to fix more urgent problems we seem to have fixed to, to focus more on, on quantity and not really fix the problems that we should have. Um, similarly, we, you know, similar analysis for change trends and compliance trends as well. And obviously, uh, also sort of the, the quick top 10 reports for these periods um, to tell me the top 10 vulnerabilities for this month, the top 10 changes, and the top 10 compliance failures. Um, so all that be the period-based analysis, um, we can definitely do it at the week level as well, at the year level. Um, but in the weekly report, we're sort of looking at the di different perspectives of risk. Um, and I want to talk about the attack surface analysis. I mentioned this briefly when we were looking at the individual um, business and host levels where we were splitting it based on the three main streams that we're evaluating risk on. Um, but what I want to pinpoint here is that the dimensions of risk that we establish and that we report on, we're not just limited to the ones that we're maintaining in the system. So we are reporting or evaluating risk based on compliance vulnerability and change. So I do want to be able to see how I'm doing this week um, for these three dimensions as opposed to, say, last week. However, we can also incorporate additional dimensions. For instance, the Encircle or IP360 vulnerability management system, it has a highly evolved uh, vulnerability scoring mechanism uh, where it looks at a lot of good um, vectors, so it, it, it evaluates the risk on vulnerabilities based on the strategy required to exploit a vulnerability, based on the skill required to exploit a vulnerability, um, and based on the risk um, associated with that vulnerability if it's exploited. Um, so we can essentially split our vulnerability data into these additional dimensions um, that are being defined by IP360, um, and we're getting that information from IP360. Similarly, we're getting a lot of information from CVSS, which again is a very detailed, very um, involved scoring mechanism where it has essentially these two, two or three base vectors and temporal vectors that they evaluate risk on, um, which in turn have these individual components that they report risk on. So we can actually do a very detailed analysis based on these individual vectors and based on these individual um, components. Okay, so let's quickly look at a few other reports. Um, so we can do uh, reports based on the importance of the systems or based on the relevance of the systems. For instance, I do want a quick report where I can look at all my production systems and see how they're doing against different metrics. For instance, I want, and again, we're, we're looking at dimensions in this chart, for instance, we're looking at dimensions defined by IP360 and by CVSS, which essentially quantify um, how exploitable certain vulnerabilities are and what is the remediation effort required to, to fix those vulnerabilities. And what we're trying to establish is of, of all the critical vulnerabilities on my production systems, just how, how easy is it for someone to exploit these and what is the remediation effort required for me to go fix these problems. And similarly, we can make this, um, th this again gives you a very accurate um, actionable metric. For instance, if I had um, another bubble a little below this one, um, then I could, I, I could compare this, those two and clearly see that for vulnerabilities that essentially are equally exploitable, I have a set that requires less effort to fix the problem. And that would probably be what I would look at. And this is very common with heat map analysis where you try to determine sort of the low hanging fruit and so on. And this type of an interactive analysis, it lets you do that very easily. Um, similarly, you can report on development systems or UAD systems. You can do very similar reports like these for based on vendors. So all the systems provisioned or running Microsoft um, software, Oracle software, Red Hat software, and so on. So I think we're running out of time, but let's go through a few of these CVSS reports really quickly. So like I mentioned, we are 
getting very detailed information from Tripwire IP360 that also correlates back to CVSS information. So by building sort of these heat maps, um, you can provide a very detailed spectrum analysis of the vulnerabilities in your system um, to the people who are responsible for managing them. Um, so the metrics that we're looking at in this chart, for instance, are exploitability and report confidence, which define um, how easy is a, is how well defined is is the exploit strategy for a particular vulnerability. It goes from unproven to proof of concept to functional to high, and not defined is essentially taken as a problem because you don't know how you don't know how easy it is or hard it is to exploit. So, um, and similarly, report confidence, which essentially defines the probability of false positives. So if you have um, a confirmed value or a defined value for report confidence for a vulnerability, that essentially means that if you if that vulnerability is reported by a system like IV360, it's very likely that that is an actual problem and it's not a false positive. And we're plotting that against, again, the remediation levels uh, required against those vulnerabilities. To give you sort of these quick insights into, you know, where the most vulnerabilities are in your system and how easy or difficult is it for you to fix them. Um, the idea being that the more vulnerability counts that you have in the red part of the chart, that is where you're, you're most vulnerable and that is where the most problems lie. Um, similarly, we have a similar heat map analysis based on the exploitability base vector from CVSS. Um, again, plotting the total number versus how many of those are exploitable and giving you a trend of the different components and so on. Okay, um, I think that covers all the reports that I definitely wanted to cover. We have more reports again, but I don't think we have time to get into all of them. So, Kevin, Stephanie, um, Thank you, Saeed. I really appreciate you sharing the capabilities of Brinka, uh, you know, as well as uh, showing how the Tripwire data can populate these fantastic reports. That's great. So I think what I'm going to do is pass this back over to Kevin really quick so we can uh, pull up our just some final thoughts. And, um, you know, again, thank you both. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today to learn about the joint integration between Brinka and Tripwire. We hope you found the presentation informative. And, um, you know, please feel free to contact Kevin, Saeed, or myself if you have any questions about the integration or would like a more in-depth demo. I'm sure Saeed would love to show you more of these fantastic reports. <laughs> and um, then finally, you know, we also have other resources available, including a data sheet which provides a nice overview of how the integration works. And then, you know, finally, a big, huge thank you to our presenters, Kevin and Sayed, for sharing this invaluable information. And uh, have a great afternoon. <laughs>